I'm Josh Badesca, the Chief Data Scientist at Domino Data Lab. I have been in the industry uh, about 20 years, and I have been interested in interpreting predictive models for some time now. Been following the space pretty closely for seven years or so. Thought this was going to be a big deal, and in the last three years, I'll say, it's it's turning out that that was a, a kind of a good bet to make. It's definitely a uh, topic that is talked about a lot, has a lot of carryover into ethics. And, uh, and bias and um, business implications of monitoring models in production. So uh, a, lot of, a lot is on the table uh, in being able to have your own personal data science playbook, a playbook as a data scientist or as a leader, having a playbook for navigating the difference uh, between interpretable and predictive models. I have uh, quite a bit of material to cover. I'm gonna probably go through each slide very quickly. All right, so why do we care about model interpretability? As I mentioned, ethics, bias, and misuse are big uh, problems in our industry. Also, regulatory requirements. Financial services have had regulatory requirements for a long time, uh, since 2011 uh, is when some of the first big ones came out. Uh, and there's a lot more that have come since then and are coming uh, that will require us as practitioners to be able to explain how our models work. And then also just trust and understanding. If we are truly trying to be customer focused and build data products that our customers can use and understand and gain value out of, they need to be able to trust those products and understand how they work. Because the last thing you want is for someone to intentionally use your data product in the wrong way because they just don't understand how it works. What we're gonna focus on is step two in this three-step process of building data science models. Uh, the miracle. We're going to break down that miracle and see if we can interpret it and put it into terms that others can understand, uh, especially decision makers and users of our products. So if you haven't seen or read the, the paper on Lime, this is an image from the Lime paper, the original Lime paper. Uh, this is what's called a super pixel. So most of this image has been grayed out and just this, pix this pixel, this super pixel is left. Uh, this set of pixels is what a um, an interpretable algorithm claimed was the reason why a model predicted or gave the classification that it did. I'll give you a hint, this is an animal. Uh, so I want you to try to guess what type of animal this is based just on this super pixel. You're gonna see the answer in a couple of slides. And this is just one, one technique that I'm gonna go over and introduce to you about how to interpret the way black box models work. Uh, real quick to set the stage, um, I noticed very early on as I dove into uh, interpretable modeling and black box models that there's a big difference between global interpretability and local interpretability. So we need to level set on that to begin with. Uh, global interpretability is when you're trying to understand the entire system. So when you're doing predictive modeling or, in, or statistical modeling, uh, in either case, you're studying an entire system, whether that's a set of data or the way some type of physical construct works. And when you're trying to make uh, you can make global statements about how that system works, or you can do local interpretability, which is one particular prediction. Let's dissect that one prediction and understand what made that one prediction predict the way it did. And you should always keep this dichotomy in mind when you're reading papers, when you're reading the news, or when you're working on your own interpretability, because you behave differently when you're in global and local, and I'll show you how but it's a really important distinction to be able to make. So definitely want to level set that at the beginning. All right, let me go through a couple of examples. Let's say that we worked for a sports organization and we were a data scientist for, uh, let's say the Dallas Cowboys and, and American uh, professional football. If you had to choose only one of the following models for predicting the purchase of multi-game tickets next year, which would you choose? So we're trying to figure out uh, how can we maximize uh, multi-game tickets next year? One model we could build is a model that said, hey, let's let's do really good at finding all the people that are gonna buy tickets next year. All right, that's one option. Another model we could build is a model that told us what characteristics exist in our buyers um, that, that are gonna do multi-game purchases. And the last model that we might be able to build is a model that tells us exactly why one particular person will or will not make a multi-game purchase so we can dissect each individual prediction as we go it turns out you actually typically you cannot do all three of these very well at the same time you usually have to choose and trade-offs have to be made so the first model is high accuracy let's get let's get it right let's find all the people that are going to make multi-game purchases and maybe we don't know a lot about them but we know who they are and we can go out and market to them the second would be let's really build a model that understands this system that we're dealing with the, these 
people that are going to buy tickets. Uh, for example, we might come to the conclusion that people in cheap seats who purchase far in advance of the game don't usually make multi-game purchases. So let's not worry about that. That last model is going to be a, an interpretable model with local inference. And this one is this one person right there, we know that they have a 82% probability of making a multi-game purchase. And maybe we can even dissect that down into exactly specify where that 0.82 comes from. So those three, again, were high accuracy, interpretable with global inference. We're making global statements about the system and interpretable with local inference. We know what each, each prediction we make, we can really dissect that prediction. Let me give you one more example. If you had to choose only one of the following models, uh, to classify images, which would you choose? One that gets all the classifications right, one that told, tells you which features in general of images are important for classification, and lastly, um, a model that tells you exactly why a certain image got its classification. So again, the same three, high accuracy, we get them all right. Interpretable with global inference, we can say things like, hey, we've learned based on our modeling that green objects with varying edges are, are usually plants. We can say things like that, perhaps. And the last one, we get the answer to our question at the beginning. Uh, we can find a super pixel that says, or there are other component, uh, other techniques as well that give you interpretability at a local level, at a point prediction level. So in this case, this image was obviously a cat because it's a human. We can take some other context like the mouse and, and the, the blades of grass, but the, the model uh, predicted this to be a black bear. And it predicted a black bear because of that super pixel on the right. And as you look at the super pixel, you can kind of see why there's that brown stripe around the neck. Maybe it saw other black bear images uh, with that type of brown striping, and, and it, but it got it wrong. But it's helpful to know why. So let's jump in a little bit and, and set the stage, uh, just build that foundation just a little bit more before we dive into uh, how do we solve this problem by defining the problem um, with uh, some some very 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 light notation here so this this won't be too heavy i promise let's suppose that there's a theory okay that states that we have some inputs some real inputs capital x and those cause a real response uh big y and that happens via a real function which is big f so i got those capital letters then let's say we've got some lowercase letters we got little x and little y which are measurable variables corresponding to samples taken from our real big X and big Y. And let's say we have a, a function, a model, little f, which approximates that true function. If we hold that to be true, then interpretable modeling tries to find the function, the little f, that best explains your system, the big F. And it's important to note that predictive modeling doesn't care about capital letters at all. You're just trying to find the little f <clears throat> that best predicts the future Y. However you can predict those little whys, what you actually see in the sample, what's actually going to happen, that's all predictive modeling cares about. So there's a big gap between the goals of statistical modeling in that first bullet point and machine learning and AI at their purest form in that second point. So a lot of this, my presentation, is about understanding that there's a gap between statistical modeling and machine learning and knowing that that gap isn't just a dichotomy, it exists along, along a spectrum, and you have to make trade-offs. Hasty, Tipsharani, and Friedman in their uh, seminal book, The Elements of Statistical Learning, talk about a trade-off that has to be made. They say you can't find that little f that both simultaneously does a good job of approximating the big f and giving you good future predictions on the little y's. Uh, you have to make some trade-offs. So we're gonna talk about those trade-offs today and kind of arm you with some knowledge and point you in the right direction for further research uh, and further practice that you can do on your own to get better at being able to do, to do this. Because I think as a practitioner, it's absolutely critical that each of us knows, understands this, this world and this dichotomy and is able to um, speak to it and implement it in our work. So let me start with a quick example from my past. I was working with a consulting for basically a diesel manufacturing, an automotive diesel manufacturing company. They came to me and said, Josh, we want to predict when our diesel engines are going to fail. Okay, so as you always should, you ask a lot of questions to really understand what they mean when they make that sense, when they say that sentence. And through question and answer, I come, I came to learn that they didn't exactly want to predict when diesel engines will fail. What they really wanted to know was what combinations of factors cause our engines to fail. 
what is the failure mechanism? And when they ran their tests and, when, and the data they gave to me was actually performed under high stress conditions, not indicative of real world wear and tear. And they did that because all they cared about was the combination of factors that are going to make engines fail. So this is a statistical modeling example, has nothing to do with predictive modeling, and it's gonna be a completely different approach to the problem. You can't just go in and use neural networks or gradient boosting, um, or really probably even a decision tree isn't gonna work. You have to go to kind of old school statistical modeling under the family of generalized linear mixed models, somewhere under that family, maybe doing a design of experiments to really solve this, this problem and answer this question. Uh, let me give you another example from my past, working with a higher education institution, and they wanted to understand, get an early indication of which students were likely to fail academically at their institution so they could do an early intervention and give the resources that that student needs to them early to head off that failure. So what were they trying to do? The key question I asked them was, well, what, what options do you have in intervention with these students? And they really only had one option, which was we're going to send them, uh, give them free academic tutoring or counseling. I said, okay, well, that's your only, the only button you have to push. Um, that if all you have is a hammer, let's just make this problem a nail. Let's just predict. Let's not worry too much about getting, understanding all the factors. We're not going to worry too much about statistical modeling. This is purely ML and AI. Let's find out. Let's get a high, high, high accuracy. And then you go in off and, and use your one widget that you have, your, your one solution to help. And maybe some of the counselors might have wanted some background. And so maybe we, on that continuum, but we're not all the way over on the little F. Maybe we want to understand a little bit of the big F. But still, we're mostly just worried about those little whys and trying to get that, that, that function, that model that's going to predict well. So hopefully that gives you a sense for kind of the flavors of problems that you're going to see out in the world. And in my experience, about 5% of the time, all you have to do is interpret is statistical modeling only. And this is, this is in, in the world of a data scientist. In the world of a statistician, these numbers would be flipped. But And then about 15% uh, of the time as a data scientist, I find that you, need to, you don't have to care. You don't need to worry about statistical modeling at all. You don't need to worry about interpreting. Just go out and predict. Throw the kitchen sink at it. All you care about is accuracy. And then most of the time, I'd say about 80% of the time, you have to do a little bit of both. You're somewhere in that middle ground where there needs to be some interpreta interpretations, some understanding of the model, but um, you also have to predict really well too. So the future is all about automation and AI is taking over. So we're going to need to know how to answer questions such as depicted in this, in this one of my favorite cartoons here. I'm going to skip this. This just for the sake of time. This is just motivation for why we have to have black box models in the first place. Uh, basically, this is saying some problems need nonlinear models. You can't solve everything with a, a linear model or logistic regression. You have to use more complex models to get good predictions. So let's get into uh, actually what you, what tools you have at your disposal. So first I'm gonna start with some old school tools, uh, some oldies but goodies. They are, you probably gonna to focus on more modern tools and learn how to learn these more modern tools, but you shouldn't forget about these old ones. They still work really good. So the first one I'll mention is just linear models. Uh, don't forget about fully specified linear models. Often you're going to want to baseline with these at the beginning of a data science project. Why? Because they give you a, they're very interpretable. So this is an example of local interpretability. Uh, let's say we, we fit a simple model with two coefficients and an intercept, and we're trying to predict house prices. We find those uh, coefficients, and then we, we make a this is local interpretability. So we're talking about a point prediction. We take one house. That one house we're predicting is going to be worth uh, $711,000. And we can break it down with a simple model saying, hey, 300,000 that came from bedrooms, 200,000 of that came from the square footage, and the rest was due to the intercept. You can fully specify it. The problem with linear models is sometimes they don't capture the system very well. So if the little f of a linear model doesn't really represent the big f of the, of the system, then this interpretability here is not as great as you think it is because it's, it's not representing the system. But I still like to baseline with these often. And these fully specified linear models also do great at global interpretability as well. As you hopefully learned in Stats 101, how to interpret a coefficient in a linear, linear model, this particular data is coming from a study on exercise where the dependent variable was the amount of oxygen consumed in exercise. And the way we interpret this age, for example, is for every 
year increase in age, the subjects, the people consumed 0.165 units less, because it's negative, less of oxygen. So the older you get, the less oxygen you consume during exercise, and that makes sense. And furthermore, you can say that that statement is true, holding the effect of weight, of heart rate, and a gender constant. So that's a very strong global interpretability statement. So again, don't forget about linear models. Another important one is decision trees. In the medical profession, they use decision trees a lot. They really rely on them. Uh, you'll find that doctors and uh, healthcare professionals who don't have a strong data science background have seen so many decision trees that they're really good at understanding and interpreting them because it's, it's a staple of that industry. And they provide simultaneously really good local interpretability. You can follow a prediction down to its, uh, to its leaf node or terminal node. And you, have, you can see the whole system here in one visual. So you get a good sense for the global uh, structure of the system as well. So decision trees are a great tool. Uh, variable importance plots. You've all probably seen these. They're a great tool. Don't forget about them. One problem with variable importance plots, the traditional ones at least, are that you can have a lot of different flavors. And it's hard to know which of these flavors of a variable importance plot should I use for my particular problem, or should I use the permutation variable importance plot, which is a, a totally, uh, which is a model agnostic variable importance plot. So it's hard to know which to do, and you, you can get different answers um, with those. So they're, they're, I'll show you a better way here in a few slides. Uh, here's an example of, of the permutation importance, um, very similar variable importance plot, but you get more of a, of a confidence window on those. And Partial dependency plots. If you don't know what those are, I'd encourage you to go study those, understand what partial dependency plots are. They're, they're a more traditional statistical tool, but they're still really good. And I would um, say there will be times when you should use them. Basically, they take the effect that a variable has on the prediction, and they'll show a trend graph of that across all values of that particular variable. They don't do a good job of capturing interaction effects, so that's why they're, they're limited. And also, you need, it's helpful to have one that shows the density uh, of the samples of that variable. Otherwise, you might put too much credit into this big jump up when really it's there, there aren't that many samples behind that jump up. Most of the data is here at this lower level. Principal components analysis. So I won't go into it too much, but you can dissect the variability in a system into a few principal components, and sometimes those have a clear explanation for them, and that can help you understand your system as well. That was a brief overview of what are some traditional methods. So let's now talk about exciting new stuff what's come out in academia of late and industry of late that is really exciting for uh, model interpretability and these tools should be part of any data scientist toolkit and leaders should know about them at least uh, so you so you know how to uh, you know what you're missing if you don't have it first let me break down these new tools into two camps uh, you've got tools that work on tabular data and you've got tools that work for on image and text so traditional machine learning models and ai or deep neural nets, uh, are, it, there's, a, there's a separation between those two. And let me also start out with another uh, asterisk uh, parenthetical comment, a note on deep nets. So deep nets can be further broken out into two, roughly two camps here when we're talking about interpretability with, with images. Um, there's pixel influence and there's concept ex extraction. And I'll show you examples of both. Pixel influence does things like, like saliency maps or like that, that super pixel we saw earlier with the bear and the cat, um, or the cat that was predicted incorrectly predicted to be a bear. That's that's a pixel influence uh, map. Uh, that's Lime does that, Anchor does that, Deep Shap does that, Salency per perturbations do that. There's another emerging construct which is concept extraction. This is proving most of the academic papers I'm reading say this is kind of the future of interpretability for images. And I'll show you what that means here in a second, but it's TCAV and ACE are two examples. AI Lens is an example. CapsNet is a really very promising new example. And interpretable CNNs are also pretty cool. So you'll, you'll see those in a minute. I don't have too much time to jump into this in a lot of detail, but quickly on the right of this slide are a few points that I found in academic papers that kind of poke holes in the pixel influence approach. And so if all you're doing is taking one input into a neural net, following it through to the end, and then coming back out uh, with the back propagation and getting the influence of that of that pixel, and then using that to do interpretability. There's these five points here, such as um, you only have local explainability, you don't have control over the concepts. Um, sometimes randomized networks will give you similar results uh, to to actually following uh, your your original network, and others. Um, 
there's a few holes in, in those pixel influence approaches. So concept extraction, I think, is something to really pay attention to. But pixel influence still has its place. All right, let's let's talk about a couple of these. My favorite, um, one that's most widely used right now, and every should be part of everyone's toolkit, is and especially my favorite for um, machine learning models for tabular data, is SHAP. Shapley Additive Explanations. It, up on the top right of each of these slides, I'll tell you what, what it applies to, whether it's traditional models and deep nets or both. This one applies to both. Uh, this is from Scott Lundberg, built on the idea of Shapley values. Shapley values are permutations. It's, it's a basically a, a very exhaustive permutation test. The technical definition here is the average marginal contribution of a feature or, or a variable over all possible coalitions. So you basically do all sorts of permutations tests you can on a set of data, looking at the predictions, and you see how each feature affects that prediction over all those permutations of, of all the other variables. So very, very exhaustive, very computationally expensive, prohibitively expensive without some, some approximations. So SHAP is a way to approximate Shapley values based on the type of model you use. So there's SHAP for trees, there's SHAP um, for, um, uh, for, for linear models, there's, there's SHAP for, for different things, uh, different types of models. And it's theoretically the best approach out there. Um, here's some of the output that you get from SHAP. You get this really nice influence plot here where this is uh, the Boston housing data. And it tells you, hey, the base value for this house for houses was 22.34. This particular local interpretable point, we predicted to be 24.41. Why? It gives you a nice breakdown of why. The variable LSTAT moves it up the most. Uh, the variable RM, which stands for rooms, I forget what LSTAT is, um, moved it down the most. And you can see the, the other variables as well. So very interpretable, and it also works on images, but it does so via pixel, following the pixels and pixel influence. Also, because SHAP is exhaustive and it works on all the data, it, it takes every single prediction, and uh, you can you can have some really nice global interpretability graphs. Like this is my favorite up here in the top uh, left. This is a summary plot. It's basically think of it as a variable importance plot with a lot more data on it. So you see the density of the predictions. And you also see where those samples drive the predictions up or drive them down with the coloring. So really nice graph here. A lot of information captured in this graph. I use these a ton. So summary plots are great. And some other good graphs from SHAP as well. And uh, for each of these, I've got lots of documentation that you can go in and look at later. OK, let's talk about Lime for a second. Lime is one of the, was one of the first widely used explainability tools uh, by uh, Marco Riviero. Very, very good tool, very good product. Um, it what Lion does, and this is this is something that you um, you you think of almost immediately when you think of how do I interpret a black box system? You might think, well, I, if I, I have a particular prediction. I want to know what makes that prediction tick. Well, let's build a simple model around that prediction inside of this black box space, and let's explain how that black box model works in that short in that very narrow vicinity. And that's what Lime does, builds uh, sparse, interpretable, simple models based on the black box model in a local vicinity. And it gives you very nice interpretations because it's building a highly interpretable model inside of a black box model space. You get a little more um, uh, direct interpretation. So you, for example, LSTAT, again with the Boston housing data, between 6 and 11 pushes the prediction up. Uh, rooms between 6.2 and 6.6 .6 pushes the prediction down. So very uh, specified interpretability here. And this is a, a Lime again is where we got that the super pixel, that pixel influence uh, for deep nets as well. All right, Anchor, I'll just introduce this real quick. This works both on traditional uh, and image and text data. But typically you're gonna think of Anchor as working on images. What it does is pretty, a pretty cool concept. It finds the set of pixels, so it can kind of pixel influence rather than a concept extraction approach to image interpretability. But it finds a set of pixels that if you superimpose those pixels on any other image, you're still gonna get a beagle. So you got the beagle, here's a set of pictures that, a set of pixels that uh, we think are gonna define this image as being uh, labeled as a beagle. And then you superimpose that on water, on a mosquito, on a person working out, on a flag with something that a pair a paraglider parachuter with a flag every in every case you still get predicted the beagle uh, so that's kind of a cool a way to approach it 
that also works on tabular data too, but I'll skip that uh, for the sake of time today. Now, this is something that only works, as you notice in the top right, only works on traditional data, not, not a deep net approach. But this is our first introduction in this presentation to what some people I've heard called lately, I, I didn't know this term existed until I, I saw a presentation uh, recently by Scott Lumberg and Rich Karuna, and that is glass box models. So the term glass box models are models that have interpretability built in to them. Uh, so AdTree is the first one I ever came across. Um, I met Dr. Valdez at a presentation he gave at uh, University of San Francisco, um, UCSF, and he was coming up with this concept called AdTree. He works in the medical profession. As I mentioned earlier, medical professionals are very adept at interpreting decision trees. He asked the question, when we built, when we, when, when the people that built um, decision trees built them, why were they just optimizing for accuracy? could if we take a step back and say hey when we came up with a math behind a decision tree what would happen if we optimized simultaneously for interpretability and for accuracy or what if better yet what if we had a hyperparameter that we could tune helped us get a more interpretable tree would that be better for us as practitioners because interpretability is becoming so important and i think this is was brilliant and it's bleeding over into um into image classification this this idea of not optimizing solely for accuracy, but optimizing simultaneously for interpretability. So the way AdTree works is you build a single interpretable tree, but you use the principles of gradient boosting along the way. So each stump along the way can, can be gradient boosted, but you end up with one tree that has almost the same accuracy as a collection of gradient boosted trees, but um, is one tree that's highly interpretable. So here's an example of the output from AdTree, a simple rule rules breakdown, a rules list, or you have one tree. But each of these stumps was created by gradient boosting. And so uh, you get really, really good predictive power along with a highly interpretable single tree. So kind of a neat concept. Interpret ML, I won't spend too much time on this. This is um, from Rich uh, Karuna and team. Um, Microsoft has this built into some of their products. Uh, it's uh, based on generalized additive models. I think the key thing to focus on here is this formula in the middle, uh, where you build a linear model, but instead of coefficients, you have functions in front of each variable. So that's kind of a cool way to think about it. And you, as a practitioner, can mess around with these functions however you want. Typically, the functions are a spline. They can also be a regression tree. And as in Rich Karuna's most recent work, there, there are all these collections of smart boosted trees that give you really highly accurate predictive models that end up with one linear form at the end. So again, a, a great way to get a linear model form for interpretability, but give you increased prediction. So I definitely look into those. They are a little bit complicated to build and a little bit complicated to interpret, but as a data scientist, you'll be able to interpret them. They'll be a little bit harder to explain to others, but I still think they're, they're a great option. Here's some of the output you might get. I'm going to skip that for today. You can check out uh, some of these papers to learn more about it. All right, uh, let me introduce you real quick to TCAV, uh, testing with concept activation vectors. This is where, as a human, you come up with a concept that you want to check onto images. So this is only this only works for deep nets. You take this concept, like for example, we're trying to predict zebras. Well, we want to know how much does our model look at stripes. Well, let's go get a bunch of pictures of stripes and let's feed that into our model in a smart way, and we can tell how much the stripe concept pops out in our model. There's no tool that does this for you. You have to know about a little bit about deep nets and be able to program some of this yourself. But the results can be really powerful. For example, here, let's take the top left for a second. We have a model that's trying to predict uh, ethnicity. So Latino, East Asian, African, Caucasian. And let's say that as a, as a researcher, as a human, as a data scientist, I, I have a suspicion that ping pong balls are confounding my results. And maybe this model is picking up on ping pong balls and classifying certain ethnic ethnicities based on the presence of a ping pong ball when it shouldn't. And so we run TCAB on the model, and it turns out that the green model and the orange model, yeah, they're picking up on East Asian. Uh, they're, every time there's a ping pong ball, not every time, often when there's a ping pong ball, they're predicting it as East Asian. Also a little bit with some other ethnicities as well. The blue model is, is pretty well balanced. So the blue model uh, is one that we want to use. It's less biased. It has has less built-in bias 
So you can check for these, these kind of biases. And there's other examples here as well, uh, like apron showing up when trying to predict female in this green model. So we'd want to use the blue or orange one instead because uh, they don't have that bias built in. So that's TCAV, kind of a cool idea. Um, ACE is an extension of TCAV, which finds those concepts automatically. So as a human, you don't have to come in and say, hey, I want to test for basketball, for the actual ball when I'm looking for a basketball. It kind of picks up on that for you. So I'll, for the sake of time, I'll skip over ACE again. I'm just trying to introduce you to these concepts, and then you can go off and study them more as you like. AI Lens kind of is a combination of pixel influence. It only works on deep nets. Combination of those pixel influences and looking at, in this third bullet point, neurons with higher level influence. So we're starting to look at the structure of the deep net itself combined with the pixel influence to get a better feel for what's working. Uh, for example, if you're trying to predict whether this is a convertible or not, and you have all these cars, uh, what is the model focusing on? Well, in one case, it was focusing on the hood, which is the wrong place to focus. In every other case, it focused on the top of the car, which is right. So we, hey, we can say, hey, this model is doing a pretty good job. It's looking at the right thing, yeah, and I'm more happy with it. All right, this one is really cool. So interpretable CNNs. If you remember the, the glass box model concept of add tree, where they built a single tree that was interpretable, you have a hyperparameter for interpretability. Interpretable CNNs does the same thing, in a sense, for images, for deep nets. So what it's going to do is, without any human supervision, it's going to fix the initial layers of a deep net to a particular construct. And it doesn't the, the, the computer doesn't know what that construct is, but it picks an important construct and fixes it. So it constrains the uh, layers of the deep net. It doesn't optimize for accuracy. It optimizes simultaneously for accuracy and for consistency of constructs that are important to that prediction. So on the bottom right here, you have two different deep nets. On the bottom, you have a deep net that isn't interpretable CNN, a traditional deep net. And you're asking the model here what's important for classifying this as a cat. But you got the whole cat, you got the face, and you got paws and an ear. So it's kind of all over the place, right, with why it thought uh, at this layer, why it thought that was a cat. Versus interpretable CNN, say face, face, face. So it found that eyes, the nose, the mouth, that was the one thing that it focused on. And now your model is much more interpretable. You can explain why it's making that prediction. So this is super cool research coming out of UCLA and uh, Dr. Zhang. So really, really neat stuff here. Uh, I'm anxious to see where this goes in the future. CapsNet is another great one from uh, the famous statistician data scientist, uh, Jeffrey Hinton. CapsNet does a similar thing. The second bullet point is probably the most important one here. It's, it's capturing properties of an image, position, size, orientation, velocity, uh, albedo, hue, texture. It's taking those properties and capturing them in the network itself. Again, very similar to interpretable CNNs, but ahead of time, we're defining what types of properties we, we want to capture. That's the difference with caps nets. And it does a really good job of predictions. And what it also does is allow you to reconstruct images. So on this far right, these last two, um, it was a five, and the model predicted a three. Well, you might, you might ask the model, all right, you got this wrong. Can you reconstruct for me what you think a five should look like based off of this original image? So here's the original image. Um, what do you think a five should look like? Here's what thinks a five should look like. You say, all right, well, caps net model, reproduce me what you think a three should look like based off of this image. And it does that. So you say, all right, I can see why you thought that would be a three based on this part. That, that makes sense to me. Now imagine applying this to other things besides digits, and you can see this can be pretty a pretty powerful tool. All right, that is that's my rundown of some of the cool tools that are out there. There's more coming. It's a very active space in academia, very active space in industry. Both are doing research with a lot of cool tools and tricks that are coming. But I, I'll give you a summary here in a, in a few slides of kind of what I think you should focus on for today as a practitioner. But it's definitely SHAP. You should know how to use SHAP. You should know how to use Lime. If you're in images, um, the, the principles of TCAV are very important to understand. And then I would definitely look into interpretable CNNs and uh, be aware of CAPSNET. That CAPSNET is still early, a lot more research to come in that but you should be aware of it. So let's round out this presentation with a few pointers and a few kind of take homes. What are people doing out there? I grabbed this bullet point list from conference talks. So this is all pre-COVID stuff uh, that, I, uh, that I grabbed from conferences that I attended. And uh, Lloyd's was doing SHAP and Lime, but they were sticking a lot to the linear models. 
FICO had an XAI challenge, but everything they did was in that traditional category. It was all the traditional stuff I showed you earlier. They weren't using any, any of the new stuff. Uh, Bloomberg was sticking to linear models, um, and they knew, the, the presenter said, we know that recurrent neural nets will do better for NLP, but we can't use them because we can't interpret them. Part of this is saying interpretability is so important. We're leaving accuracy on the table because we can't interpret. And especially in these financial companies, there's a lot of regulation and they have to be able to show why their models do what they do. I'll skip this slide. This was a 2018 Calgary survey of what are people doing. Uh, you see SHAP and Lime in 2018 were down low. And this is a little bit old, so they, they're probably a lot higher now, but you can see a lot of the other stuff we've talked about, people are definitely, are definitely doing in, in their interpretability work. This is a 2020 Anaconda survey uh, talking about um, who has a solution implemented for fairness and bias and for explainability. So this is really coming. Uh, planning, uh, a lot a lot on fair, fairness and bias and explainability uh, as well. 35% uh, are planning an ex an explainability solution soon and only a few don't know about it. You do this in 2015 and it's probably almost non-existent. So it's really taken off. Uh, I love Yogi Bear. This is a great quote from him. If you don't know where you're going, you wind up someplace else. Uh, so where are we going here with this? Um, and I have five minutes left and I'll pause for questions. What, what if you have to do global interpretability, uh, but you need predictive power? Well, that's really hard to do. It's hard to get both global interpretability and good predictive power. For deep nets, the interpretable CNNs are a great way to go. The tool from AI Lens that I mentioned to you where you have that pixel influence combined with activations in higher level uh, layers of the neural net um, are, are a great way. And then TCAB and ACE uh, allow you to test for certain concepts, uh, but, but you still can build whatever net you want and then go off and test for certain concepts. For traditional models, it's really, there's not a lot. SHAP is the only tool that I kind of lean on for global interpretability. And even then it's a great tool, but it, it does leave a lot to be desired. So you're gonna to have to make some, some sacrifices. If you wanna do a deep net or gradient boosted tree or random forest, use SHAP. Otherwise, you might wanna consider decision trees, elastic nets, naive bays. Those have more interpretability just out of the box and they still have pretty good predictive power. Add tree might be promising or, and you should probably just try a linear model and get a good feel for the global structure of your, of your system um, and just use that as a baseline, both for predictive power and for uh, interpretability. Uh, you, you're always going to want to figure out where you are in the spectrum between interpret and predict. Hopefully that has been driven home in this presentation today. Here are some example questions that you can use and look at later. And this is a graphic I came up with myself. So this isn't, um, you know, gospel or anything here. This is just my experience of how I take my take on the power of these different approaches and their interpretability and the size of the bubble, how often they're used in the industry. So you have the generalized linear mixed models, that whole family of linear models uh, doesn't, and interprets great, but it doesn't, it's probably the least powerful as far as predictive power. Decision trees are a nice middle of the road feature. Add tree gives you a little bit more predictive power and it's just slightly less interpretable than decision trees. And then of course you got neural nets up the top and a lot of stuff in between. And then finally, this is my last content slide. You might want to just think about it as, as a decision flow, decision tree. Uh, am, do I have a predictive problem, an interpretable problem, or a little bit of both? If it's predictive, throw the kitchen sink at it. Go for it. Deep nets, grading boosted machines, random forests, just, just go and get good accuracy. If it's interpretable, a lot of these end with contact your local statistician because you're really going to need to be doing statistical modeling, and that's different than machine learning and different than AI, and most um, master's degree programs don't have the time to teach you both proper statistical modeling and proper machine learning and AI. So usually you just get one or the other. And then if you're in the case where we usually are, which is you have to do both, the hardest to do is when you have observational data, meaning you just collect what's given to you and you have to do global interpretability. And I, I covered some of this in the previous slide, but you can I summarize it here again. I and mean, if you can collect data and you can define what data you get, then you can design a proper experiment and probably you'll probably end up using some linear models in that case. But usually we're here in this observational place. And so these are some of the concepts we talked about today. The presentation and the code can be found at this website. I'll leave it up for a second while I get uh, that spun up for myself here on another screen. I'll bring it over. So you can go to dominodatalab.com slash try. When you get in there, there should be an XAI project that's loaded for you. 
but if it isn't, I will show you how to get to it uh, myself. But it should be loaded loaded for you when as for one of your default projects when you log in. All right, when you land inside of uh, Domino's trial experience, by the way, it's a, it's a free trial experience, you get two weeks in here, but you can download, I've got all the code and everything in here. Um, when you land in this trial experience, you're gonna have these little projects that are gonna pop up. You'll probably just have Quick Start, you'll have XAI, and the rest of these are projects that I created myself. But when you're in here, uh, up in the top left, you can search for any project you want. So let's say we want to look at AutoML. We can hit search there, wait a second, and it's searching through all the projects that people are working on for AutoML. And they'll pop up here and you can you, you can either click view all and see more, but here's some projects for AutoML. Uh, my project is under XAI, and it'll be the one that says Josh Badesca, because other people might have, uh, have similar projects that are around XAI. So let's view all, because I don't see mine here yet. And here's mine down here. So Josh Badesca, explainable AI starter code. So when you go into that project, uh, I've got a little overview with a readme that gives you some background information and some instructions on what to click on and what to do. Um, like for example, you can fork this project inside of Domino's um, data science platform here. You can go over to files and I'll do that now, open that a new tab. And here under files, uh, you'll see, here's the PDF of the presentation I just gave you. And then two things I call to your attention are SHAP and LINE and traditional methods. Uh, I'm gonna open up traditional methods here. And I'll also open up SHAP and LINE as well. So those are both notebooks, uh, Jupyter notebooks. If we look at the traditional methods, you can view it right here in the viewer or you can hit launch and you have for two weeks, you have access, free access to compute. This particular instance of Domino is on AWS, but you can also have on-prem uh, if, uh, you know, if you're a customer. Uh, so looking at traditional methods, uh, it just goes through and shows you some of the code. This is meant to be kind of a tutorial with a lot of explanations you can walk through. Um, Scatterplot matrices, um, principal components analysis, building a, lin a linear model, doing some coefficient analysis, and then, um, doing residual analysis. So some really good, important traditional methods that you should know about. And then interpreting coefficients with this graph here that I like, which uh, you color by negative or positive and you show the uh, minimum absolute effect size at the 95% at the confidence level inter interval. So you're 95% confident that these, this is the most that effect can have, or, or the minimum, excuse me, that that effect can have. And then we've got some partial dependency plots and ice plots and some other cool things. Um, if you look at um, SHAP and LINE, it's too big to view in the little Domino viewer. So you're gonna wanna click Launch Notebook. And when you click Launch Notebook, it's gonna spin up uh, the container that Domino has saved and attached to this project, and it'll spin up that Jupyter Notebook for you. Uh, let's see, I uh, spun it up here a second ago. So a second ago, I spun it up myself, so we didn't have to wait for that container to load. And you can see the same file system in Domino, and I can open up Shap and Lime, and uh, then I can I can hit Run All, and then you can um, you can just play around with this as, on your own. Okay, so while this is running, you'll 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 see some of the um, it takes a, a minute to load some of the initial stuff, but then you'll see these force plots start to pop up. Uh, you have Lime Lime graphs, and you can steal all the code and do this on your own. Um, variable important plots from SHAP. Here's a summary plot from SHAP that I really like. Um, partial dependency plot from SHAP. And then a graph I've made on my own down at the bottom, which includes the SHAP partial dependency plot, but also says, hey, I want to know where one of my, the point I'm interested in, where's that fall? And so I colored that one black. Um, so you can steal some of my code here for that function as well. All right. Um, only three minutes over my goal of giving 10 minutes for Q&A. So I will stop there. Uh, and um, go back to PowerPoint so that you can see the, uh, the address once again if you didn't catch it earlier, and be happy to take questions. Okay, uh, Lion versus SHAP, what are the pros and cons? So, great question. I, uh, SHAP, if there is a SHAP uh, optimizer for the model at hand, you, I, I typically use SHAP. Theoretically, it's more sound. Um, Lime, again, is a local approximation within a bigger space. And so that works great. But um, theoretically, if you can do 
all the permutations across all the predictions, you're going to get a more robust answer. Um, so sometimes Lyme and SHAP won't agree. And if the SHAP works, then I, then I go with SHAP. Um, but there are many cases, well, not many, there are some cases where the SHAP explainer doesn't work, like for um, K nearest neighbor, for example, and I show this in the Jupyter notebook. The SHAP optimizer isn't built out for that yet, at least it wasn't on the version of SHAP I have. And so it just takes forever to run because if there's no optimizer, you're doing all the permutations and it's just, it's completely prohibitive. You, you just can't do it. Um, so in that case, Lime is a great tool to use uh, for those. Okay, next question from Emil. Interpretable as an important factor, what he thinks about actionability, whether the end user can make action based on the model. That's a great, so great comment on actionability built into our models. I like to say as a good data scientist, get really excited when they build products that can be used. And if you, if you think with that mindset, you're gonna approach your work a little bit differently than just let me get the best accuracy. From the very beginning of your project, you're gonna say, ask yourself, and you even talk to end users and, and do some mock-ups, how is what I'm gonna build be used and in what way? And would any of this, so you have all these explainability tools in the back of your mind, would the output of any of these explainability tools be helpful? Would, for example, you're at a, a customer care center and you're predicting this person's gonna churn and we should offer some type of special promotion. Well, maybe it would be helpful if they understand why we're thinking that person's gonna churn. That might help them give the right offer. It might help them trust your little AI widget bet more. Um, so understanding that and building that into your product from the beginning is, is I think what you're talking about there, Emil, about actionable. Uh, intelligence. That, that's great. Okay, next question. Could you say a bit more about the trade-off between interpretability and prediction? Why does it manifest itself? Biance variance. Yeah, it is a bit of a, that biance variance trade-off that I mentioned from the that book by uh, Hasty, Tipshani, and Friedman uh, at, early on in my slides. Um, really, it, it comes down to also just when you're doing a statistical modeling approach, um, you're trying to understand. There's also causality causal modeling, which I haven't mentioned, uh, plays a factor in this as well. But it's more about trying to understand the system. And those statistical models, if they can represent big F, your system, well, then they're going to be much more interpretable. And so if interpretability is a big deal, decision trees are better. Linear models are better. Add trees better. Um, even naive Bayes is better. Because it naturally gives you a way to interpret the coefficients and interp interpret the model or how the model works. Um, so it's more, it, it, there's a little bit of bias variance, that's why there's that dichotomy, but it's more about the structure of the model and how easy it is for humans to understand how the model works. Domino Data Lab website asks me to make an account to start a free trial rather than giving me access. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you sign up to, to try, you just enter your information and, you, and a, I think you, I don't know if you need it, if you can, if you can use like a Gmail address or if you have to use a work address, I forget. Uh, email address you do need to sign up and then you get free you get access and if you'd rather not sign up but you want the presentation and code reach out to me on linkedin and i'd be happy to give it to you next question from joseph most of the talk was focused on training but the need for interpretability where the need for interpretability is, is greatest what about serving where local explainability may be required for regulatory reasons shap is very slow uh, what do you recommend there the problem here is uh in the in when the model is in production and if you, once the prediction's made, if you need to get that interpretability in a heartbeat, um, what can you do? Uh, yeah, it, it, especially if you don't have a predefined search space. If you have a predefined search space, of course, you just go and, and compute all the SHAP values or whatever, or line values for whatever it might be. And, uh, and you have those ready to go in a database and you just plug them in. If it's all brand new data, then yeah, there, there's no silver bullet right now that I know of to, to make that, uh, those predictions quick, those interpretations quick. You might try Lime, because Lime's gonna give you very similar results to SHAP and it might be quicker um, if you, you say you've tried SHAP and it's slow. Can you in some way take advantage of model interpretability methods for feature engineering processes? Interesting question, but you definitely can. Um, so for example, a common, technique is to use a variable importance plot and then to shave off the last few features and leave those out of the model to get a simpler model, especially if you need some interpretability. That's a, that's a common way to go. I would definitely always use a SHAP variable importance plot versus your traditional random forest or XGBoost variable importance plots. They're going to be more accurate or theoretically sound.
yeah, you, you definitely can learn about the interpretability of your process and use that for feature engineering. All right, we're at the top of the hour. Let me see what these last two questions are. Can you, you still can get access to the files if you have a direct, uh, you just need a direct link, link to those files and you can actually still get them. Uh, in order, when you sign up for the trial, that allows you to use the compute for free, but a little workaround inside of Domino's trial environment is if you have a direct link to the location, you can kind of browse around, but you just, you can't start up anything or run anything. And the last question, interpretations being mislead, misleading, yeah, that, uh, you get in, Paul, you get into the whole bias and ethics there. There are, this presentation did not cover techniques for bias discovery too much. It did a little bit, but not, not uh, in a satisfactory way. So you definitely need to do some ethical and bias validation of models uh, as well uh, in order to understand and weave that into this interpretability. I think that's all the time we have. Um, I'll try to answer the other questions uh, offline. And again, connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like to chat more about this. Um, thank you for your time, everyone today, and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.